Good afternoon, and welcome to the first edition of Ed Talk here at ANC Media. I'm Scott Lay, Nevada County Superintendent of Schools, and I'll be your host. Each month, we're going to delve into a different topic that uh, impacts our schools, our students, and our community here in Nevada County. My guest this evening is Eli Galp. Eli, welcome. Thank you so much. Eli is the Associate Superintendent in my office, and the topic that we are discussing is mental health. Uh, mental health in our schools, something that really came to the forefront during COVID, something we'd always worked with before, but uh, when, when the pandemic came, we had students at home, cut off from friends, from social activities, schools, really jumped out and uh, we wanted to let the community know what's going on in the schools, what's happening behind the scenes, what partner agencies uh, we work with, um, just kind of how the whole thing works. So Eli is kind of the, the resident expert in, in, in our office, the superintendent of schools. He's uh, in special education, but oversees a lot of the different programs we have. He's involved in them, uh, interconnected. So perfect guest to start our, our show off uh, with mental health. So I thought good thing to do is we're going to start off at pre-COVID times. We okay. can all think back to that <laughs> and kind of what mental health supports looked like pre-COVID. Sure, sure. Well, thanks for having me here, Scott. I appreciate it. I love talking about mental health in schools. It's just, it's a burgeoning field coming uh, into fruition. As you know, many uh, parents, community members, legislators have a greater concern with this. So it's an exciting time to have this as part of your passion. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, previous to COVID, mental health services were relatively limited. They, many of the schools didn't have access to full-time counselors. Those that did often vacillated between academic counselors and mental health counselors. Oftentimes students would, the only way for students to receive mental health services is if they qualified for an IEP, an, an individualized education plan, signifying that the student had a significant disability, mm -hmm. an educational disability requiring those mental health supports. With that requirement came the school's requirement to provide those services. So there was limited ways for children to receive those in school. There were, there were opportunities though to receive services outside of schools through partnering with Nevada County Behavioral Health, for example. Mm -hmm. Some of the challenge with that, of course, is they are restricted in their own process about who, who they can serve and their funding models. So for example, they specialize in serving medical eligible students. Right. Sometimes we would get students who are what we would call the working poor, who make enough money to not qualify for Medi-Cal, but don't make enough money to have their own mental health supports. So I think there's an, op there's an opportunity now to, yeah. to, to address that. And there definitely, it definitely was that opportunity before. And I know one thing that um, also is a challenge here in Nevada County is geographic uh, mm -hmm. limitations for families. We've got schools up in North San Juan, we've got schools in Chicago Park, Penn Valley, mm -hmm. uh, South County, and sometimes getting students to these services at behavioral health or just in Grass Valley if they're private, that can be challenging for a family. Yeah. And so those I know were some of the other barriers we reached. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, I think we see, you know, there's, you always want to find something good out of something bad. So we're looking at that through the pandemic and there was some, some good things, this is one. Uh, so the pandemic hits us and we realize we need more help for not only kids, mm -hmm. parents, um, teachers mm -hmm. uh, with that. So we got a lot of programs. We have the state and the feds send us, um, send us different programs. Mm -hmm. right, so let's talk a little bit about that, what, what we're doing now. We're two and a half, three years past mm -hmm. yeah, and absolutely. moving into it in support for our students. I think first and foremost, many of the schools have that recognition, so they're looking to beef up their own mental health supports. One of the things that I'm really excited to talk about is a partnership where it's our office, Nevada County Superintendent of Schools, and Nevada County Behavioral Health. This, we started a grant writing process about two years ago. We were accepted into the grant, and as a result, we have, at this point, almost two and a half million dollars in government grant funding to, to create and support mental health. And we've done that in a unique way in identifying what's called a board certified behavior analyst. And what a board certified behavior analyst says is they are masters in shaping the environment in order to help shape the behavior. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes in mental health, I look at it as there are a couple of different types of providers, but the primary one are counselors. Counselors do a great job of changing the internal dialogue. Why do I not want to eat that chocolate bar? 
Whereas a behaviorist, they're going to shape the environment. So it doesn't matter if I want to eat the chocolate bar or not. If the chocolate bar is not there, I'm not going to eat it. So the behaviorist can shape the environment. Mm. A counselor can shape the internal dialogue. Having both of those opportunities is a wonderful benefit to our schools because we can reach more students than ever. This grant allows us to not only hire BCBAs, but to create a training program for their support called Registered Behavior Technicians. These are, these are paraeducators and instructional aides who go through intense 40 to 60 hour training who then provide support and implement those plans that the behavior board certified behavior analysts create. It's a lot of wonderful opportunities out there. That is, that is. And I remember when the grant first came in and um, we first, we didn't qualify. Yes. in our county but then luckily as you mentioned we got it i think we're at five districts mm -hmm. unfortunately although it sounds probably to our viewers two and a half million dollars but when you divide that up over three years spread it out it doesn't go as far as we'd like we, i know we originally wanted it every one of our schools at least in every one of our districts and charter schools um, and we, we couldn't right. do that although they're on the list mm -hmm. for us to more funding come to mm -hmm. get there but yeah, so what are, you, what are you hearing out there in the field, the benefits of these BCBAs working, mm -hmm. um, you know, some yeah. of the positive gains we've got? Great question. One of the fun things about this program is it's not tied to any kind of specific student or specific requirement. So schools have this local control to really utilize this expert behavioral managers to create whatever they need. Some of the programs I've seen is they're utilizing these to work with their yard supervisors, to have appropriate mm -hmm. pro-social behaviors and teaching kids how to learn how to play, how to take turns. If you can imagine post-COVID, some of the younger students may never had that opportunity to learn what yeah. it is to be a first or second grader. They missed kindergarten, they come in, yeah, they didn't have that socialization, so yeah. So there's they, yard supervision. Yeah. Other districts are working with one to two students who have intense behavioral needs and really supporting those young individuals so that they can go back into their class, be successful in their academics, be successful in their social areas, so that they feel powerful, mm -hmm. so that they feel like they're a, a young citizen. Yeah, and, and I think a, a real benefit too is that they're at the schools. Yes. We're not asking parents to drive their student into Grass Valley or, or to Nevada City. They're on site. And I think you hit the nail on the head too. Not only is it beneficial for what we're seeing, I feel like a lot of the other social agencies, social services agencies, are seeing that same thing of, mm -hmm. let's go to where the audience is. If the audience and our customers are the students and their families, we know that they're gonna be at school. We don't know if we can get them to an office at 4.30 in the afternoon. Right, may not work for the parents, may not work for the student in the office. If it closes at five, short window of opportunity. Yeah. So yeah, it's always much better, as we know, to meet the students where they are. Yes. With that, now as we go into, I think you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about the collaboration we have in the county, as you've, you've mentioned, with behavioral health and, and other agencies. But there's a whole host of people on site. I like to call there's always your unofficial counselors. I remember I was at Clear Creek for 25 years and I was the unofficial counselor. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but you, you just, you help kids out wherever you have, like you mentioned, yard duty. You have, uh, you know, the beloved lunch lady. Mm -hmm. You'll have maintenance. Uh, everybody kind of keep an eye on kids uh, with that. But we have people, you know, beyond that, a lot of, uh, a lot of titles of people there that is confusing yeah. for not only educators themselves, but parents when they come in. And just kind of going through some of those, I wrote a few down there. Maybe you can kind of go through what these are, what their actual roles, right. roles go ahead and are test in the school. So this is your test today. <laughs> you know, and our, our experts, besides our BCBAs, we have MFTs. Marriage and Family Therapist. Which is there. We have LCSWs. Licensed Clinical Social Workers. Which are there. And what, what's the difference between those two? Those two have different areas of focus uh, when they're in school. One of the things that a marriage and family care th therapist does is they have a primary focus in providing therapy, not just to uh, young children, but to all ages. That's their focus when they're learning. A licensed care social worker, they are also experts in not just counseling, but they know how the social agencies works. They know how to navigate between different social agencies to provide the most benefit and support to a family. Say it's child welfare, say it's behavioral health, right. say it's schools. They know how to interlace all these agencies to provide the best level of support. That kind of help parents navigate the system. Absolutely. Which at times can be confusing right. and frustrating. Of course. Um, our good old-fashioned school counselors. Oh, they are always in, in high demand at every school. Yeah, and so what would their difference, you mentioned again, I think it's good to reiterate that, between a counselor and, and the BCBAs? Because the, I thought it was really good what you came up with 
what one does versus the other. Yeah, thank you. One of the things that we really look to is as a counselor, they're there to sit down and talk with that individual and get them ideally to understand their actions, the consequences of actions, and ideally to shift that consequence into something much more pro-social. Instead of trying to get your attention by punching you, right. maybe I should learn how to ask you. Positive way. Positive role models. Rather than negative. Right. Yeah. And, a, be, a, and a board certified behavior analyst would take that same challenge and then reframe it in a different way to say, let's look at how you line up. Let's look at how far away you are. What is the best way to communicate if you're beyond arm's length, for mm -hmm. example? Right. That makes sense. And then the kind of the last that we have that's in the school area that often gets confused with our counselors, school psychologists. Absolutely. And what's their main function within the schools? So school psychologists, were, they have a variety of functions. One of the functions for, for mental health is they too are able to provide counseling services. One of the other benefits for a psychologist is they can do assessments. And assessment is one of the conduits to special education eligibility. So they're, they're an expert in looking at data, just mm -hmm. as the BCBAs are, but they look at da data on the internal sense, whereas a, be a behaviorist is looking at environmental data, a school psychologist is going to look at IQ, behavior rating scales, attention deficit disorders, mm -hmm. things like that of how does the internal biological or emotional state affect a student being in school. Right. Okay. They're definitely the difference right there. There's a great explanation of, of that. Um, the other ones we have, we hear about artosis, who help with SEL. So now we've got two acronyms we've thrown in there. We've got a social emotional learning and a teacher on special assignment. Mm -hmm. So what's the role? And we don't have a lot of those in, in schools yet. working toward it, but what, what's the role of that position? Oh my gosh. Well, first, you kind of, I feel like you're going to get rid of my job because job security for me is acronyms. Right. And you're giving away all my acronyms. I'm giving secrets. away all the secrets. All right. So with that being said, what a TOSA can really do, supporting uh, social emotional learning, is that they can like, look at the whole system. What is going on with the whole system on a classroom, on a campus, providing a curriculum and some guidance to help the teachers, to help the school culture be, be reconstrued into a positive place that's supporting pro-social behaviors across the board. So for example, catch them being good. Instead of looking at yard supervisors of you're gonna get in trouble, mm -hmm. highlight those successes. Look at Scott, he does a great job engaging with those other kids. Highlight those, those successes so that other students can see the benefits from it. Teaching teachers how to reframe things in a positive manner to help kids learn how to do social problem solving. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you get, you're feeling sad or mad at your friend? Right. How do you have those conversations? What do you do? Yeah. So you not only change the classroom environment, but looking really to the school environment to make it a more supportive, uh, emotionally supportive uh, area for our kids. And, I, and I'm thinking too is, you know, I, I'm thinking ahead, we've got our Teacher of the Year dinner coming up. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I noticed while reading all the biographies of these Teachers of the Year from our different districts and charter schools, what they like is someone coming into their classroom and observing mm -hmm. a professional like this. What can I do better? Mm -hmm. How can I help all the kids? Am I hitting all the kids? Am I missing that one student in the back? Mm -hmm. And how do I be more positive, not negative? So yeah, that, that's just kind of the, the more formalized role. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, I'm so appreciative when I hear those teachers who take that information and run with it. Yeah. and. It's just a boon to the community. It is, and, it, it, and it's, that's not an easy thing to have someone come into your class and critique you, uh, but it's always the, the, uh, the mark of a highly skilled uh, and dedicated teacher, paraprofessional, whatever in our, in our schools that want to, to, to do better. You know, I'm glad you bring that up. We've been talking about so many support services, but they all funnel to the teacher. Yeah. And so, you know, having those charismatic, passionate teachers like we have in Nevada County, incorporating all these different acronyms and names and services, that's what makes it really successful. Yeah, I was thinking if you send a student to a counselor and you're working on behavior, but you come back to a classroom and it's not that rich environment that would support that, it's not gonna work well. Right, well. exactly. And we have, we're so blessed we, we have so many great yeah. teachers who are yeah, passionate are. about our kids and our community. We are. Kind of the last group that I like, and, and uh, you introduced me to this group called the A-Team, which right away I went back to that classic 80s show. Um, <laughs> not the A-Team there, but the A-Team for what they do. Tell me, tell our audience you know, who the A-Team are and what they do. Sure. So the A-Team actually stands for the assessment team, and it is a collection of more than 50 mental health practitioners on our, on our campuses. They, they consist of counselors, the board certified behavior analysts, school psychologists. 
We're also incorporating and inviting in other social service agencies, um, mental health, child welfare services, probations now attending. And really the focus is there is to provide shared training and resources. We've been talking about a lot of these positions. Many of our schools have one of these positions mm -hmm. available, if one. And lonely position it's that a, can be. Exactly, and with these lonely positions comes a hard time learning new skills because you have no idea who to bounce these ideas mm -hmm. off of, who's your colleagues to share information and resources. So as a, as a county, what we've been able to do is pull these groups together for now going on three years, just prior to COVID, and it's been a great benefit. We've seen a lot more collaboration. We're developing consistencies of practice amongst our community. Mm -hmm. So if you're down at Pleasant Ridge and you move up to the North San Juan Ridge, ideally you get the same service and the students can have those same behavioral expectations so they're not starting school fresh. Right. Having these groups of people like that really creates mm -hmm. an opportunity, not just for our students, but again, those social agencies then to go in, let's have a focus training with all the counselors all at once. Right. You can imagine the challenges of pulling 10 different school districts in, trying to create a shared, uh, shared professional development time. It's really tough. That'd be tough. And I like a common language going on for all of us. Again, those small schools, having come from a very small school, you know what it's like to be that, that singleton. Yeah. And, and this is a fantastic group. They also come together for crises, don't they? They do. In they the do. Community. Unfortunately, when that does happen, it's a great group to draw their expertise to help schools right. get through whatever it may be. I'm glad you bring that up because that is another benefit of them being so tight-knit. In addition to supporting their own schools, if there is a crisis, you know, a death of school for a tragic yeah. accident, a car yeah. accident or whatnot, they can come in and support the students. Many of our students feel shock and at the loss and no, they don't know how to, as well. and staff, and they mm -hmm. don't know how to process that. Yeah. So having not just their own counselors come in, our mental health counselors, but again, that community response, behavioral health works amazing with our schools. They're quickly in there supporting our students, understanding the role of mental health, understanding how, how without that, things can really turn downhill and people can get in a significant funk. Yeah, absolutely, and, and you bring great segue bringing up behavioral health. Um, I think you know during COVID, we started working with our partner agencies in the county in, in much more uh, mm -hmm. detail and um, once a week, twice a week, mm -hmm. looking what can we do, how can we help. So those uh, those ties are are much we're much closer with our partners. Yeah. And when they call, you're not, who is this? You know exactly who it is. Hey, it's behavioral health. They want to get mm -hmm. members of the A-team to get on. Boom, we make the phone call. Yeah. It's happening. Okay, we've got an incident at, let's say, Forest Charter. They need some assistance. Immediately, it doesn't matter, weekends, weekdays, right. whenever. Absolutely. We can make that happen with all our partnerships, which is great. And also really fits into the future of, um, of mental health services that we're providing here in the county for our students, the schools, the community. Uh, and what's interesting for our, our listeners is you know, we're in the process. Most of these come in two to three year grant cycles, mm -hmm. which we can never figure out why the government thinks that is the best. <laughs> but they do. And we have a lot of things going on. And I think one of the challenges we realized is we were seeing duplication of efforts. Mm -hmm. And we were seeing probation was getting a chunk of money to serve mental health. And behavioral health was getting a chunk of money. And school districts were getting it. And then the county office got it. And it was really trying to pull everybody together to mm -hmm. say, Okay, no duplication of efforts. We've worked together. We put all this money together for our programs and we can do some really cool stuff. And, and talking about that, um, moving forward. So just mental health is in LCAPS, the Local yeah. Control Accountability Plan, which everybody, I'm sure if you're a parent, you've heard of that or you've been mm -hmm. invited to an LCAP meeting. So how does that fit in as we move into the future? Well, I think, as you said, the government is recognizing the need for these resources. And what I am thrilled at is the government's also recognizing that educators are not the experts necessarily in mental health. Mm -hmm. We have all these support positions, but again, our primary focus is academics in school. So yeah. these, all these support services are there to help out academics. So I think it's an amazing opportunity for us to work in collaboration with child welfare services, mm -hmm. with child behavioral health services, so we can create a more robust opportunity, kind of looking beyond just the student, because mm -hmm. we recognize a student is only as successful as their parents. Right. right? So helping those parents become more successful, more, and less worried about food scarcity, less worried about how am I gonna get my child to school because my cars broke down. Yeah. So being able to provide additional resources beyond the school day or beyond just a student is something that a school would never have this opportunity 
but in partnership we can. We can do that, which is exciting. And we know, as you mentioned, you know, our governor, Newsom, he has sent um, programs forth. Our legislature has done so as well. Mm -hmm. The federal government has done so. So some of those, we mentioned the mental health services, uh, student service, sorry, I always leave the, the second S out, uh, ACT, MHH, MHSSA, right. another acronym in our world. Uh, it was one of them that we started talking about. That's right. The ones in the school. Yes. Uh, another one we have is the... Uh, interagency leadership team, which is made up of the heads of different agencies, where it's uh, county government, our office, behavioral health, mm -hmm. different agencies, law enforcement as it's necessary, probation. So they're all there. That's exciting, and you're part of that as well. And, and we're yeah. working on that to tie these together of, of proactive services. So Absolutely. that's exciting. Je that's just starting off. Yeah. Even though we've informally done it for years, but it's part of that interagency cooperation. Absolutely. And I find that one really particularly interesting because initially that one was there to support foster youth. So right. Yeah, it had it, that's where it had its humble beginnings. Absolutely. You know, and then it morphed into instead of supporting students who are already in the foster care system, how can we support students who are at risk? Mm -hmm. How do we support families who are at risk of having their children go into the foster youth? So it's really broadened this perspective, which then allows us to really broaden the, the net of support, so to speak. Right, and we're in those kind of final planning stages with our partner agencies on continuum of care, no duplication of efforts, mm -hmm. making sure we have everybody at the table to support the students in schools, and then rolling out, rolling out our plan. And if that wasn't enough, we have two more plans that have come <laughs> in. Uh, we have what's called known as SIBHIP, which is the Student Behavioral Health Incentive Program, which is another pot of money that came, mm. came to county offices and our behavioral health offices. And we're working with our high school district on this and to beef up their wellness centers yes. that our comprehensive yes. high school district has. And uh, that's exciting, too. That's also in the infancy stages. We're finishing up exactly what's that, what's that going to look like with the high school district and hopefully rolling that out in January 2023. That sounds great. Uh, which would be good. And then the latest one we've seen come across our desk, which originally in its initial proposal wasn't really going to work in Nevada County. We somewhat disregard it was the community schools oh, grant, um, which they finally realized in Sacramento creating another school is not going to work in Nevada County. We have enough schools, we have mm -hmm. enough districts, we have enough charters. Mm -hmm. Now it's allowing us to push those services like we've talked about out to each one of these districts. And every one of our charter schools and districts has qualified, which is exciting. Absolutely. Now our goal, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, is wrapping all these programs <laughs> so we have someone to oversee it and provide highly quality services. Um, I think one thing that we didn't talk about, this is all wonderful. Uh, exciting, but something we face on a daily uh, basis is lack of oh, people to fill these positions. So maybe, you know, talk a little bit about that. Oh, that's a hard one to talk about, yeah. you know, so. because it's, we're calling our, ourselves out for saying we have great plans, but we don't we have do. great people yet to fill, to, to put those plans yeah. into place. Yeah, and so one of the things that we, one of the benefits in, say, developing our registered behavior technicians we're not pulling from the mental health field. Mm -hmm. And so we're not in competition with those other social services agencies for counselors or therapists. Um, one of the things that I'm really putting a lot of my hopes into too is I just heard that, you know, Governor Newsom has that new bill looking to create 10,000 new mental health workers in our school systems. Right. That doesn't create the immediate... Doesn't, doesn't help us no, right now, no. but it's, it's addressing the problem in a year or two. So. so I think one of the things that we're actively looking for and is how can we find those quality supports mm -hmm. in our schools in order to make the most out of these resources that we have. Yeah. It's, a, it's a rarity, I feel like. I've been in education almost 20 years now, and we have more money and less staff than ever before. Absolutely, and it's not just a problem here in Nevada County. We're hearing it across the state. It's in LA County, it's in Sacramento County, mm -hmm. Yolo County. I feel really bad for our tiny little counties like the joining mm -hmm. Sierra County, mm -hmm. Alpine County, trying to find these experts in their community. And part of it was, as you said, you know, we've got this new money that's come in. In the past, we didn't. So kind of the pipeline shrunk right. of getting these people mm -hmm. certified to work in schools. So mm -hmm. I know one thing we're actively doing uh, with our, our legislative representatives and with the governor's office is asking them for waivers to allow us a little more local control and bringing these people in and then training them. So they may not have all the acronyms after their name, right. but they're a quality person. They're in the field. We can train them the rest of the way to meet the needs of Nevada County or 
Placer County or Yolo County or Yuba. So let's let's work on that. So that would be great. Absolutely. One of my biggest things that I personally love to do is what to do what's called grow your own. Yeah. You know, we find those quality people in the instructional world. We tap them on their shoulder and say, you have great potential. Yeah. And so this is yet that another opportunity for us to say, you have an amazing personality. You have amazing sense and ethics. We'd like you to see you do more. To pull it all in. Yeah. Pull it all in. Absolutely. Um, one thing I was going to focus on before we close, kind of tie it all together. Yeah. Social emotional learning. I know that in some circles has got a bad rap yeah. and, I, and I'm not sure why. What people are spinning it to be is not what it is and it's something we have been doing in schools. Well, I've been doing education for 32 years in Nevada County and we've been doing it in Nevada County. It's all of a sudden got tied to other names which I, right. I don't think is fair. But let's talk about it. What is social emotional learning in our schools? What, yeah. what does that look like? So really what it looks like is we help them set and achieve positive goals. We help them show and talk about empathy and what it means to feel for another. We help establish positive um, boundaries, as we talked about, what it means to be a good friend. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's an SEL lesson right there. How to make responsible decisions for yourself. Lastly, how to understand and manage your own emotions. That's right. it. No Sounds extra, like no, nothing else. It's really kind of having an awareness of yourself and having an awareness of how, how yourself relates to the world and to the environment around you. Right. That's it. That's it. That, that's useful for students and adults alike. And, and so similar, I was talking to a high school class today and, and a career tech ed, asking, well, what do you do? You know, and they're going through my job and, I, and what, are, what are important attributes? And I said, one, be nice. Yeah. Listen, respond appropriately. Mm -hmm. Look at people in the eye. <laughs> you know, just some simple basic things that sometimes we seem to get away from that we need to remind people of that. Mm -hmm. How do you want to be treated? Well, treat others like that. Absolutely. Be open, be tolerant. Uh, you don't have to agree. Not asking to do that, not asking you to change your values, but be understanding, be tolerant. Um, it sounds like it almost used to be what we would call a civics lesson, and yeah. it's just been rebranded re to something different. Yeah, something different for that. Well, thank you for, for clarifying that up and putting that down there. Now, kind of our tie-in here, pulling this all together huh. with that. And again, it kind of goes back to our, uh, our partner agencies. Mm -hmm. um, what overseeing... Kind of, uh, how would you put it in your own words of putting this all together, mental health in our schools, and kind of what you would like to see, let's say, oh, in yeah. five years out down oh. the road? What, what, what are your hopes? What do you think we're going to see? Well, first, I love when somebody gives me the magic wand. Exactly. So this, Who doesn't I'll, love the magic I'm going to take wand. the magic wand. And so in five years, what I would like to see is a robust mental health support network on school provided during school hours for those students who are in crisis, who need extra supports, to be as successful as they can in class and on the playground. Next, what I would love to see would be that we utilize our schools, where all the students are, as a resource hub for families. Mm -hmm. So we can have mental health supports, we can have health supports, we can have child welfare services supports. So if a family's struggling and needs supports or f food insecurity, they can come to the school. We know that would be an effective place because that's where their students are. That's where the kids place, are. Yeah. Buses right is there, so we don't have to worry about transportation. Yeah. So I, I, in my perfect world, schools would become a resource hub for students and families. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's exactly what I'd like to see coming up. And you know, again, it's um, Nevada County is a pretty amazing place with our agency collaboration. You know, so, I've heard that. You know, when I talk to my peers across the state they kind of looked shocked at how well we work yeah. with one another. Yes, we do. We do that when it comes to school safety. We do it with mental health needs. Um, just bring it out. Everybody stands back and just says, well, what's best for the kids? And that can be probation at the table. Yeah. What's a better way for us to serve these students? I mean, we, I remember the discussions we had is, okay, we're not coming onto the schools in uniform. Right. We're right. just wearing polo shirts and jeans, you know, mm -hmm. and, and to break that barrier of a scary badge, right. uh, you know, and, and just kind of mellowing out, no uniform um, and those kind of things. And, you know, your vision of what you would like to see, I think, I think that'd be fantastic. That's my goal as well. You know, I said 32 years now in education, and I think we are, we are getting closer to that goal mm -hmm. um, with the recognition by the state and feds that this is important, this is critical for us in our schools. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, what I typically say is COVID was a terrible thing, is a terrible thing. One silver lining that I have is this awareness of mental health in schools. Absolutely, that we got to do it. So with that, you know, and, and the whole purpose, we get up in the morning, we go to work is for students. 
yeah. and extend it in their families. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, any, any last words? No, I appreciate you that's having right. me on here. This is an exciting opportunity to share this information and yeah. to be a part of it. Yeah, it is exciting. And I'd like to tell our viewers, if you have more questions, you're happy, you're welcome to come talk to the county office. Uh, at the Nevada County Superintendent of Schools Office, you're welcome to talk to Behavioral Health, you can talk to Probation Department here, you can do Social Services, see how we're all working together for the betterment of students. Um, I'd like to thank you all for listening to the very first, or not only listening, but seeing the very first edition of Ed Talk. All right, take care, have a great rest of your day, everybody.